English uh, for speakers of other languages and also oversee our digital literacy work. Uh, so I'll just have each of us maybe do just a, a brief hello and intro and then we'll talk about what we're going to discuss here today. Uh, my name is Jose Hiraldo. I am the program assistant in Nordic Square Community Alliance. Um, also, I oversee the ESO classes in our organizations, and I work with outreach engagement with the community. And yeah, we will happy. We are we're happy to be here and share with you our experiences during the work that we do with the community. Thanks, Jose. Hi, my name is Janine Campbell, and I'm the ESL Digital Literacy and Citizenship Teacher um, at CMAC. Uh, Currently, we are um, we are, are, are working with the uh, Leeds Wellness Center in South Philadelphia um, to provide in-person and online classes, and also a digital skills lab, um, which is also um, you know focused on uh, really providing people with the low-cost internet and devices uh, that they need, and we 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 serve uh, we serve. We really focus on serving marginalized communities um, and, and those who are, uh, especially in our immigrant and refugee um, and low income in South Philadelphia and all parts of Philadelphia, actually. Thanks so much, Jenny. Um, so well, the structure for today, we're just going to do a little intro conversation with you all since it seems like there's been a lot of sort of listening to people talk, we thought maybe we'd invite you to just talk to each other for a moment. And then we're each going to share a little bit about um, the work that we do in our programs. And we kind of introduce some of the challenges that we've encountered from kind of like big picture to, you know, micro level with um, trying to work on digital literacy skill building with people who English is not their first language. Um, and so we'll kind of do some little snapshots of some of those challenges and some of the findings or recommendations that we have. Um, and then we'll try to leave some room at the end for, for more discussion or questions from you all. Um, but could I just get, just to kind of get a sense of who's in the room, could I just get a show of hands of people who are right now doing work with English language learners uh, connected to digital literacy? Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and people who are doing that work um, in like community-based settings. Okay, quite a few, okay, great, thanks. So we're just gonna have a, and first, uh, this was the agenda I just talked about, so. <laughs> so we'll just do a, a couple minutes to share with a partner, and I encourage you to talk with somebody maybe you haven't met before or you didn't come with. Um, just to introduce the topic, what are some challenges that you have had with using technology in a non-native language? So that might be English, if English is not your first language, or it might be a, la a different language when you're somewhere else where you know, you're not speaking the main language. So um, let's just have two or three minutes. You can say hello, say your name, maybe share a challenge that you've encountered, or someone you know. If, if you can't think of one, maybe somebody that you know has had a challenge working with technology. So I'll give a couple minutes for people to, to do that. <laughs> Just a partner. So I'm a project manager here for my new paper call. So we're standing on a bunch of projects a lot. Oh, um, but also personally, I'm a doctor over at Drexel for health and health I pride myself in cultural content because my 
translation capabilities but it's not intuitive to actually be able to use them and like take advantage of those things yeah yeah so yeah. that's so nice that they have those capabilities but it's like how do you <laughs> yeah. how do you actually change the language yeah yeah so there's the question of uh, uh, language uh, spoken language and then there's a the question of computer language and so those Facebook accounts are probably created partly because they don't remember their password and so the the idea of having to remember your password instead of just saving it and forgetting it is, is something that also needs to be taught. And the other thing is that websites may have a language uh, feature that you can 
push a button and change it, but if you navigate to another part of the same website, um, it, it, it could all be for nothing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, something that strikes me in all this, uh, what a lot of people are saying is that these are challenges that in our in our first languages, in our native languages, we have with computers, and then just layer on the the language barrier, and it's extra challenging. Were you, were you gonna say yeah. Something? Hi, Danielle Austin. Uh, we run a workforce program that is doing technology training for high school students, and one of the things that we're getting a lot of questions about is our first year doing it first year recruiting, but the question we get from a lot of um, school liaisons is like, can students who are English language learners do this training? And so it's less about like using the actual technology and more about getting into the, like how to create and design websites and we don't want to make this an exclusive program that has to, you know, English speakers only, but at the same time, like we don't want to set people up for failure um, if they're not able to navigate the actual, you know, coding and, and the language of coding. Um, is, is challenge we're trying to explore right now. So, mm -hmm. so if I'm hearing you right, Danielle, also part of it is like we're trying to reach a lot of different groups of people with digital literacy, and sometimes it like what what fits one isn't going to fit all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. I mean, I I know this conversation could keep going, and um, you know we were kind of struggling with the, we have an hour to sort of share a little bit about what we're doing, but there's so much. Uh, experience and knowledge in, in the room and in our community with doing this work. I feel like any of you could be on this, you know, talking from this position <laughs> as well. So I hope we can just contribute a little bit to, um, to the conversation just from our own experience and hopefully this conversation can, can continue through TLC and other, other arenas. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Jose to talk a little bit about his work. North Hello everyone, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm really excited and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak and, and share the experiences that we have in our organization with, with all other organizations because I think uh, everybody here uh, is on the same plane. You know? um, so, North Square Community Alliance uh, was, uh, was founded in, eight, in 1982. Um, was founded by a group of women that want to take control back of the of the neighborhood, um, so providing safety and a healthy environment for their children. Um, the mission of Noise Square is empower the residents to become self-reliant and also build on improving uh, the physical, economically, um, the social and cultural and educational aspect of the neighborhood. Uh, all the residents and the community members are part of organization. We serve they serve as uh, mem uh, board members um, through surveys. Uh, the community members work at Noise Square also, so they know the community that surrounds us. So for almost 40 years, NSCA has responded to the, needs, to the needs of the community by providing comprehensive solutions such as affordable housing, community organizing, employment training, early childhood education, and youth uh, after school programs. Also, home ownership counseling, that that's a very important thing that we are working right now, since all the gentrification that's happening in our communities. Um, and comprehensive case management service. Uh, we gave uh, a follow through to our clients. We don't just uh, give our service and, and we just dispatch it out the door. We keep going and we keep assessing them to, to give the tools and the resources that they need to, uh, to break up the poverty cycle. So uh, we implement this year uh, two new programs. One of them is Conecta Dead, Connections in English. Um, basically, we are doing a digital skill uh, course, but it's more focused on elderly the generation, okay? Um, we, um, obviously, by um, uh, meetings with the community members, um, we realize that um, for all the full fault um, they didn't have that access to uh, their meetings that they want to have or they want to help their grandkids doing their homework or they can't do it so or they want to pay a bill online but they have to go to the city or they got to go to a, uh, another um, um, building and do an hour of, of a waiting list and and they when they could just do uh, uh, an online appointment, and I always told them that, that you can do everything uh, online. Um, 
also our, our, um, our program, um, we are trying to have youth community members that are more tech savvy to engage with, the, with our senior um, um, folks so they can have a conversation, they can have that human interaction between them and it helps them um, stay out of the streets and, and, and prevent this, uh, this ongoing gun violence that is uh, affecting all Philadelphia. Um, these are some of our students in our digital, uh, North Star Digital Literacy course. Um, we have, um, we are serving low-income families, as I said, also the senior citizens, and we are always providing them with, um, we are always providing them with uh, different resources, but we take it a little bit step further um, by having a, a more of a holistic approach to our clients. We don't, we don't, we don't want to see them just as clients, we, don't, we want to see them as family. Okay, so we, we are assessing their needs and what they're finding, like offering childcare. Um, the ESO classes is a very important part of our, of our, um, of our organizations because we try to merge both, uh, both programs and uh, helping our students to find better jobs or, or getting to university or having their kids um, have better opportunities. Um, one of the challenges that we have been seeing in our community are the schedules. Um, obviously, um, not everybody is in their home all day. They gotta work. They get kids. They get different situations. So that's a that's a approach that we have taken to be flexible on our schedule. Um, we provide classes to our community senior center on Mondays at 9.30 and Wednesday for the community and Fridays for our own NSCA staff because we realize that not, not all the people that work in our organization are digital, are digital um, tech, they are not tech savvy. Um, sometimes they have um, um, difficult sending emails or working in a spreadsheet on Excel and that's something that we do uh, in our daily life in the, in, in the organization. Um, transportation. Um, we try to be flexible about that. Um, obviously, um, we try to cover classes online or do um, meet the clients in, in different scenarios in a public library or in a park or trying to, to be as simple as we can so that they can have at least that opportunity to have the classes. Um, Childcare. Um, I have many, many. Um, students that come with their children to our classes and they are afraid of, the, of not coming to classes because they think that they're going to get kicked out because they have children but as by experience when I was going to college I had two kids one of them is 13 years old so I went to college with my kids and I, and I was very um, um, I had the benefit that the professor just let me keep my kids so who am I to just not letting her uh, be with the kids in the classroom. Um, language barrier. That is a uh, um, thing that's one of the the biggest challenges here. Is that everybody can relate to that. Um, having a native a native a native uh, speaker like in Spanish or or another language uh, is a very important part of these programs because. At least with my with my uh, with my senior uh, citizens, um, they want to relate to somebody. They want to have somebody that can guide them, or they can explain them the digital literacy language. Because we think that um, even in English, it's a little bit difficult. But imagine translating that that it doesn't translate uh, literally, like saying that, saying like boy is niño. It doesn't translate like, like that. So you gotta break it down that language and explain them the vocabulary, but keep it in English also because if they're going to a store or they want to uh, buy a computer or a device, they, they should know how to ask for that. Okay? Um, physical disabilities. Um, obviously, we are trying to um, have as many folks connect to this digital world, but there are physical lim limitations. Um, in the senior center, we have to be more patient 
we have to uh, take, it, uh, take it slower with them, have one-on-one -on -one sessions with, with, the, uh, with our clients, because sometimes they have arthritis or they, are, they can't even move the mouse. And that's something that, that they feel like they're, no, they're not doing it okay, but giving them that confidence of you're doing it right, you just have to keep practicing. And we also work with, um, with different sites so they can exercise their, their model skills uh, because that's just basic uh, interaction with the computer. So um, we are always trying to assess all those uh, assessments. As I said, um, we, um, we strive to have a welcoming classroom from the first step that the student go through the door um, to the classroom, um, be adaptable. Um, as I said, we have different schedules, um, we have different support, um, and that also comes with the respect and the sense of belonging. Um, sometimes we, uh, we have struggle engaging with our, with our clients, and we need to have more, uh, more instructors that in their native speak languages. So, because um, I have been with my teachers, my ELSO teachers, but I feel like it's not the same interaction um, between, uh, and I have the, the most successful um, classes is with those that, that, that speak English, Spanish and English, the teachers, um, comparing it to the other classes. Um, I feel like they feel respected, they feel that they have a sense of belonging. Uh, reasonable accommodations, that's what I was talking about. Um, the mothers that have kids, um, the students, um, we try to um, offer the North South Literacy, Literacy course to as many clients that we can because I feel like the, the students that always are, are, are in school in the mornings, um, they can have an advantage with that course because it goes through all the, the the basic digital skills that they need, so they can have an advance that can have a, res a certification on the resume even before graduating from high school. So we try to be adapted on that. Um, as I said, multilingual instructors and case management avail availability for the different um, um, necessities that our clients has and empathy. Um, I always try to see my clients as family. Um, when, um, I don't know, when things turn difficult, I always try to imagine that that's my grandma, that's my uncle, all oh, these are my, my nieces, so I try to uh, feel some empathy with them. And, and imagine myself when I, um, I, was, um, I spent 32 years in Puerto Rico, I moved here one year ago, and trying to go to those challenges and how to access the resources, I always try to imagine myself in their position. And, and always having them, um, having some support for them, um, calling them, text messaging them, um, and since we are a community base, we see each other like in daily, so that's a, they become a part of our family and that is where. Um, I think that, at least for me, that's it. Thank you for keeping me on track of the time. <laughs> I'm going to leave you with um, Jeannie. Thank you so much. Well, thank you everyone. And thank you so much, Jose, for um, talking about some of the challenges and also some of the opportunities. Um, that, you know, it's been quite a journey in the last two, three years of seeing um, digital literacy and digital access, um, just kind of the, this sort of explosion of opportunities, even with all the new challenges. Um, I'm the ESL Digital Literacy and Citizenship Instructor for CMAC. Um, CMAC is an organization in South Philadelphia that focuses and has been focusing for like the last I believe it's like 36 years on education, civic engagement, community development, and they also have a health and social services department, which I am a part of. Um, in um, with 2020, uh, we 
actually saw a, um, again, it was kind of a moment of sort of radical transformation of what I saw kind of happening with access to, to digital, uh, not only to devices, but also the ability to have real digital literacy classes and also um, the development of an on-site digital skills lab. Um, and also a new team. In fact, one of my, my colleagues, my coworkers, is here, Cassandra uh, Monathan. And um, it's just been really great as an ESL teacher for, for us to start to explore the idea of hybrid online and in-person classes for ESL and citizenship students, but also the way that we could um, you know, we could just improve access to the community. And that, that, that is something that was, um, it was just really great that we were able to um, not only have the need, the necessity kind of drove what our efforts, but also that we did receive funding to support our efforts from, from the city, from Comcast, which we are so grateful for. And, so this is just kind of what it's sort of grown out of. Uh, we, we actually have a team of uh, the adult, adult literacy and access team. Um, and we were able to open a hybrid program, multi-level classes, which is great. Uh, ESL classes for beginners, pre-beginners, high beginners, intermediate and job seekers. Also improve our citizenship uh, program because now we were able to have citizenship classes in person and also online and also to start to um, you know start to make some efforts towards health literacy uh, now we are located at the Vise Wellness Center which is a uh, health center that is uh, kind of devoted to um, serving the local community in South Philadelphia the immigrant and refugee community and that's just been really beautiful and I've seen some lovely things come out of that, some uh, lovely kind of partnerships. Uh, we have a partnership with uh, Refugee Health Partners uh, at Jefferson, and so that's been really wonderful. However, you know, of course you can imagine, um, you know, the, the virtual, our virtual class program, our online class program was kind of created sort of on the fly. And uh, that was, we came across a lot of challenges, uh, but, you know, that transition really arose out of necessity and a need, you know, to provide support and instruction um, throughout the, the pandemic. And um, out of that, we saw a lot of opportunities, uh, such as students could work on free digital literacy assessments on devices, also ESL learning websites. There's a host of them out there that are free. Uh, Rapid communication, our, 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 communi our ability to communicate um, with our clients and our community members really changed because now all of a sudden we were communicating over WhatsApp, we were communicating over WeChat, we were communicating over text messages and that was really something that was just wonderful to see. Now challenges. Um, our, um, our, our, in, in all our in our ESL um, classes and citizenship classes, um, ex and especially in the online classes, we saw really like uh, class enrollments skyrocketed <laughs> uh, because all of a sudden some barriers that had previously prevented um, students or community members from getting help or from um, you know getting either the instruction or the device they needed, or the help they needed with, uh, you know, getting that kind of access to attend a class, that completely changed. Um, you know, I would, okay, and so, you know, we, we just found a lot of things with that. Uh, this was, we were able to, just an example of kind of the tools and supports that really helped with the virtual classes, uh, Notion web pages, What's Up became our main communication platform, and and also Google Classroom. So uh, you know opportunities. You know again the access to digital lab or on-site assistance with devices with troubleshooting with um, getting these devices. It just was um, it was great. You know 
one advantage is that we had this on site and what I'm finding right now as we start to move to having in-person classes again is that this is great because uh, what we are we can do is we can make scheduling and making appointments and following up on appointments for the digital skills lab um, that could become a digital literacy activity in itself so you know, the, I would say, and, and also, of course, the, the access, uh, just to finding low-cost devices, uh, what we were able to do with Chromebooks, signing up for ACP, low-cost internet, uh, and of course, things like drafting a resume and searching for a job. Now we were able to really do that in an yeah. in-person space. Challenges were timing and scheduling. Uh, you know, and, you know, it's just some ideas is, is to, for the future that we're kind of thinking about is scheduling around times like, for example, when people are coming off of work or on Saturdays, possibly. Um, you know, just an example of, um, you know, one of the challenges with working with North Star Digital Literacy Assessment, and I say GCF Global and many of the others, was just kind of breaking down the language, uh, really, and giving more of a kind of step-by-step -step instruction breaking larger tasks into smaller tasks, and kind of things of that nature. And so, you know, just some recommendations uh, for anyone else who is trying to do this. Um, accessibility equals engagement. Breaking down larger lessons. Um, for, you know, really understanding kind of the devices that's, that students or clients or community members are working with and what their internet access is looking like, whether they are looking at things on a phone or on a laptop, uh, things of that nature, and also with typing, keyboard. Um, we had the most successful, we could work very closely with the, uh, the digital access team and especially with the digital navigators. Um, you know, and I think that's something that should be expanded and kind of encouraged. Um, taking advantage of as many freely available learning apps, websites, things of that nature, activities for self-study, and also making real life scenarios such as um, you know, making an appointment online, um, part of the lessons. I think that's really important. Leaving a lot of time for individual work and a lot of opportunities for that. I'd love to assign homework. Um, and just to, when, when I think at, at an organizational basis, when thinking about, thinking about ed educational technology, uh, there's so many great things that are coming in out. The best ones, of course, are subscription-based. <laughs> So that can kind of sometimes be a challenge. Um, you know, consistency and communication are key. Uh, you know, I think having a class at the same time, you know, on the same day, um, you know, it makes it easier, you know, to join for those who are interested in joining. Um, and I think that ESL and digital literacy can and should be integrated. Uh, kind of moving forward and um, you know what we're seeing is there's a lot of assessments and things of that that are kind of being developed to um, you know accommodate and also you know really be able to hone in on you know these these two different these varying skill levels in these two very different sort of areas sometimes um, you know just some of my favorite tools and resources. Uh, I've relied a lot on um, freely available tools and resources online in my classes. And uh, you know, what I've found is it's not so much about the resource, but it's kind of about adapting yeah. it. Knowing your class, knowing your students, knowing the community you're speaking with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, or no, you know, so having that available. Yeah. Also making classes collaborative. Inviting oh. in, uh, you know, other for example, with digital navigators, having the digital navigators come in and talk about what they're doing and what they're trying to do, uh, I found that to be really helpful. Uh, you know, so it's not just so much the teacher and the class. Um, highly visual uh, content or resources with images. Uh, you know, some of the good ones: North Star, live worksheets, learning chocolate, vocabulary for ESL Fest, uh, ESL Video, Unite for Literacy. Quizlet. Okay, and 
Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Is the same. 
um, most of what we're using technology for is connection and communication. So those teaching those skills can be part of um, a bigger communicative project. And I think that there's a lot of opportunities there for people to share and um, share about themselves, share about their culture, share about things that motivate them um, through using these tools. And then applying those tools out in the world just gives this extra level of like, okay, I can do this. Um, and meaning to to it. So, so one of the I, this is actually up from our Google Docs workshop. Um, we did a newsletter, which we use Google Docs to create. I know it's a little blurry, but um, we were kind of doing some writing and then put pasting it into a Google Doc, and then people could kind of edit it in real time and edit other people's work. And we we practiced cutting and pasting images, so there are a lot of tasty food images that made it in there, or, you know, places people like to visit, but it kind of gave a very defined task. So a place you like to visit, a food that you like, that you love to eat, or a person who's important to you. Just write a few sentences. And then we could use that to actually create something that looks kind of nice, you know, and we did a little formatting, um, learned a few formatting tips. Um, and had a newsletter in basically a couple, of, you know, an hour or two. Um, and then this one was just playing around with tables and links, as you can tell, so people could write um, their name, a place that they really love, copy and paste a picture of it, and a link to the website that they found the picture on. Um, so, and we used that same document so people could practice creating a table um, and doing some formatting with the tables and stuff like that. So again, this was something that we created together in real time. We practiced sharing the document so then people could um, see what other people were putting into it. And there's kind of that, you know, just a little bit of an excitement factor of like, ooh, the Grand Canyon, wow, I'm gonna go there. So, um, so this is what I mean by thinking about ways to make it kind of engaging and it's communicative. And this is just the medium the technology is just the medium for having that kind of connection and sharing. Um, and then let me come back to this. So it's just another thing that I'm sure is not a surprise to anyone. This is very small, but um, it's that I think Jose mentioned this too. You know, it's like the vocabulary is a challenge. So when we're using North Star, for example, if anyone's been using North Star. Um, a challenge that we've been having with that with English language learners is, are we assessing the language knowledge or are we assessing the digital skill knowledge, right? And I know that they've been working on that, trying to figure out, figure that out. There's a Spanish, there's a Spanish version of some of these assessments now. Um, but even aside from that, if we're doing digital literacy with English language learners, breaking down the vocabulary, spending more time there is something that I feel like you know, it's important, and so this was just an example of, from the North Star curriculum, something additional that I added, which was that they pull out a lot of key, key um, vocabulary. They often have, like, in the curriculum, a little image or something, but just to sort of keep going down that road, I, this was to try to show the difference between um, commenting, uh, suggesting, and editing which is three choices you have when you use Google Docs. Um, and so I would do something like put some of the words up on the board and put some pictures up on the wall and people could grab a picture if they think, oh, I think I know what word this goes with. And then we just kind of talk about it. So before we really get into doing the content and understanding how to use the tool, just making sure we understand what the vocabulary is, how to say it, um, and then as we were doing the workshop uh, on Google Docs, I'd also sometimes have participants talk about what they were doing. Um, so they go through some steps and then talk with a partner, like, can you show your partner how to do this? So then they're using the vocabulary to tell someone else what to do and showing them so it's repeated. But that kind of thinking about like, okay, this isn't just how to do the skill, it's also being able to understand when someone is telling you, you know, can you just send me that email and attach that document and, you know, get it to me by tomorrow. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, so 
we want to be able to know what does it mean to attach a document, um, you know, send an email, and be able to communicate that to somebody. All right, and um, I think the last thing, thank you, okay, the last thing I, I was also just going to share with you, um, resources that we use, and um, these may or may not be familiar to people, but if you want to talk, chat with me afterwards about any of them, um, some of them are digital skill building, some of them are just tools for vocabulary building or um, for just keeping information together, um, and some of them, like Engine is actually an online English learning platform um, that we've been using, but you need digital, some digital skills to be able to use it. So. All right, so that's it for me. Just a few of the little ins and outs of, you know, what is what are some of the considerations in the moment in the classroom um, or in an educational setting when doing work with digital literacy with English language learners. Um, so we're going to wrap up with you all today by just kind of thinking about, we went through a bunch of thoughts pretty quickly here. I'm sure you all have your own experiences that you can share. Um, just to take a moment with a partner again, and it could be the same person or you could switch it up. It's totally fine if you want to switch and talk to somebody else, to get to know a new person. Um, one thing that you're thinking about from this breakout session, something that came up for you, uh, something you'd like to try, um, something that you would like to maybe um, explore further. So I'll give you all just a couple minutes again to, to talk with somebody, somebody near you. What are you taking away? Oh, we, we're on a panel to so be together, I think. Yeah. Are you with, um, do you feel like you are I'm moderating. Do you mind if I join your conversation? Yeah, this is crazy.
uh, because this is moving, this is like, this is our moment, right? The TLC conference, this is our moment moving the needle, digital equity. So with the things we've shared, the things that you all have talked about today, what does this mean for us in terms of um, digital equity and what we actually need in order to achieve that, especially with English language learners, people who are facing language barriers? Um, so how can these conversations sort of feed into that conversation and how we build towards whatever the next step is with all this money coming in, with the planning that's being done, um, how do all these levels of thinking about access um, impact our, our planning? So conveniently just going to put that out there. We'll have to go to lunch. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much.